Hi, I'm Greg Marcus. I'm the pastor of Imperial Valley Christian Center, and this is our TV, internet, YouTube ministry, 30 Minutes Towards Victory, we call it. And what we're talking about right now is this. God wants to answer your prayers. This is program number three of God wants to answer your prayers. God, that's what I want to get into. I want to build it up into you that God desires to answer your prayers. God is not the hang-up when it comes to prayer. He's not the one holding back your answer. God wants to answer your prayers. We started out by looking at Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, where Jesus says this. He says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. And I'm shortening that just to the two part. And they all mean the same thing. All the ask, seek, knock, they all, he's basically repeating the same thing in different ways. But so I just want to focus on this part. Ask, and it shall be given you. And in the beginning of the next verse, verse 8, he says this, For everyone that asketh receiveth. Ask, and it shall be given you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. Ask, and it shall be given you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. What I began to explain to you last week was that this is Jesus' way of telling us what God's attitude towards prayer is. He's telling us what God thinks about our prayers, how our prayers are received in heaven. How are our prayers received in heaven? Ask and it shall be given to you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. He's telling us what God's attitude, his reaction to our prayers is. What is God's reaction when people come to him in prayer, when we come to him in prayer? When you come to him in prayer, what is God's reaction? That's what Jesus Jesus is telling us here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, and Matthew chapter 7, verse 8. Ask, and it shall be given you, for everyone that asketh receiveth. And then we looked at James chapter 1, where James is basically saying the same thing. He's also showing us what God's attitude towards prayer is. Here in James chapter 1, verse 5, he says this, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him, and it shall be given him. So, so now he's talking about wisdom, but it applies to everything. So he says this, uh, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all. He giveth to all. What did Jesus say? For everyone that asketh receiveth. James says he giveth to all. Jesus says for everyone that asketh receiveth. And then James go on to say, say <laughs> James goes on to say this. He says, who giveth to all liberally, generously, and upbraideth not. He doesn't get upset. He's not angry. He's not upset with us. When we come to asking for things, who give it to all liberally and upbraideth not. He's happy to see us. He's not upset to see us and upbraideth not and it shall be given him. So again, we saw James is talking about in that scripture, he's focusing on God's attitude towards prayer, God's attitude towards prayer. Now, the reason it's important that you understand that is because sometimes we read those scriptures. We read, I don't know about you guys, but I read those scriptures, Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, ask and it shall be given you. And my reaction was, well, I don't think that's true, Jesus. It, lots of people ask and it's not given to them. And then I began to understand, no, he's just telling us God's side of the prayer, God's side of prayer, what God's part of prayer, what God's attitude towards prayer is, but that's not all there is to prayer. And you can see that even more clearly here in James because the very next word he says is, after he tells us, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all liberally and upright it not, and it shall be given him. The very next word he uses is, but, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, but let him ask in faith. Not, in other words, even though it is God's attitude to grant our prayers, even though he's uh, generous to all who call upon him, even though he's happy to see us when we come in prayer, even though it shall be given to us, we still have a part to play. I like to think about it this way. God can say yes to our prayers and we can still fail to receive the answer. God can say yes to our prayers and we can still fail to receive the answer. God can say yes to your prayers and you can still fail to receive the answer. That's what James is talking about in the next verse, verse 6. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth or he that doubteth, the modern translations say, 
He that doubteth is like a wave of the sea, driven the wind and tossed. For let not that man, which man? The wavering man, the doubting man. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. So we have a part to play in receiving the answer. It's not just up to God. God can say yes to our prayers and we can still fail to receive if we don't do our part. So that's the second thing we began to talk about, doing our part. What is our part? What is our part in prayer? And I wanted to show you these two parables about prayer, two of Jesus' parables where he talks about prayer, two of Jesus' parables where he talks about prayer. And, and I want to show you what he showed us over there, Matthew 7, 7, what God's attitude is towards prayer. But in these parables, he's telling us what our attitude towards prayer is. Over there, he showed us that God's attitude is ask and it shall be given you for everyone that asketh receiveth. But here in, my, in, in these two parables, he's going to show us what our attitude towards prayer is. And the first of those parables, which we looked at in detail last time, and I'm just going to review it a little bit here, but we looked at it in detail last time. The first of these parables, I want to call it the parable of the friend with chutzpah. You know, chutzpah is a, a, a Yiddish word, has sort of a Hebrew background, and it means audacity or boldness or super confidence or confidence that's over the top, you might say. That's what chutzpah means. So this first parable, I want to call it the parable of the friend with chutzpah. And then the second parable we're going to look at in just a second is this. I, I want to call it the parable of the crazy widow lady, the parable of the crazy widow lady. Okay, so let me review that first parable because I want to make sure you understand what Jesus is telling us our attitude towards prayer needs to be. Turn over to Luke chapter 11, the gospel of Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, verse 5, and he says this, and he said unto them, which of you? And I said, that's the key. That's the key to the scripture. It's sort of the twist he's going to put on this scripture is which of you? In other words, he's expecting the disciples to answer, well, yeah, no, but no, I wouldn't do that. I, after they hear the story, uh, he's expecting their reaction to be, I wouldn't do that. But the, re the point he's making is that in order to receive answers, prayer, answers to prayer, you got to be like this. Hallelujah. So he asked them, which of you? It's sort of a, it's, kind of, it's a twist on the parable. It's a, sort of a joke he's playing on them. It's sort of he's trying to show them, look, this is what you got to be. And so he says this, I'm reading from the King James, and he says this, uh, and he said unto them, Jesus said unto his disciples, which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, friend, lend me three loaves. And I explained to you last time that it's not when we read it, you know, in our traditional Christian mindset and our traditional Christian viewpoint, we kind of see the friend as showing up at the other friend's house at midnight and he sort of apologized, oh, please, you know, can I have some bread? You know, I'm sorry to bother you. It's midnight. But that's not what's going on here. I explained to you that in Hebrew, Jesus didn't speak Greek. The oldest copies we have of the New Testament, of the Christian Bible, the oldest copies are in the Greek language, but Jesus didn't speak Greek. These are translations of what Jesus said. And Jesus, I'm convinced Jesus spoke Hebrew. So now, here's the reason I'm telling you that. So here, where it says this, And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him? Well, in the Hebrew language, that word say, the equivalent of that word say would be the Hebrew word amar. And it can be translated to command or to order or I would say to demand. And that's what's going on here. See, that's the, the picture you need to see to really understand this parable. But the friend isn't just going at midnight. The friend isn't just asking for bread. But the friend is going at midnight and he's demanding bread. He's going to his friend at midnight because he needs this bread and he's telling him, hey, give me some bread. Give me, we, we have some guests. Get up out of that bed and get me some bread. Can you see that? It's important that you understand that to understand the point that Jesus is making here. And you'll see that I'm correct when you see the conclusion of the parable. Hallelujah. 
And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within, or I explained to you that from within probably is referring to him inside. Every other time in the Gospels that word is used, that Greek word is used, ethos, esothen, it means on the inside of the person. I showed you some examples of that last time. Esothen. So he's not saying this out loud. He's not responding to his friend. He's just thinking this, we would say. He's saying it on the inside. Inside of himself, he's saying this. And his friend comes and demands, right? hey, give me some bread. I've got some guests. They showed up unexpectedly. Get up out of that bed. He's demanding that his friend act like a friend is one way you could think about it. Hallelujah. But so the friend on the inside of him, he doesn't respond. He doesn't say this back. There's no conversation going on between the two of them. He just thinks to himself, trouble me not. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. In other words, he's saying, I don't really feel like getting up. I don't feel like getting up. On the one hand, you have the friend demanding that he give him the bread. On the other hand, you have the friend who doesn't feel much like getting up out of bed. It's late at night. He's in bed. Everybody's in bed. He doesn't feel much like being a friend to the other guy right now. He doesn't want to get up out of bed. And so then Jesus explains the parable in the next verse. And he says, I say unto you, at that point, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if the friend is going to get up. The other friend, the first friend is demanding that he get up and give him bread. The second friend doesn't feel like getting up. He doesn't want to get up. He's thinking, no, I'm not going to get up. And so we don't know what's going to happen. And then Jesus finishes it off in verse 8. And he says, as I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And so we saw that that importunity is the key to answered prayer. That's what Jesus is trying to show us. The key to answered prayer is importunity. Now I showed you that that word last time, I showed you that that word importunity, the original Greek word that is translated into English as importunity means shamelessness. There's no question about that. That's what it means, shamelessness, hallelujah. And so the NIV translates that, that, that uh, passage this way, because of his shameless audacity, he will rise and give him whatever it is he needs. Because of his shameless audacity, he will rise and give him. Because of his shameless audacity, he will rise and give him. So what I want you to see is that is what Jesus is telling us our attitude towards prayer needs to be. Our attitude needs to be one of shameless audacity. Our attitude needs to be one of shameless audacity. There are some people who study the Hebrew of this, and they say this. They say that that word translated shameless audacity, that the equivalent word in Hebrew would be the word that comes down to us as chutzpah. Because of his chutzpah, I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his chutzpah, he will rise and give him everything that he needed though he won't do it because he's his friend because he is his friend yet because of his chutzpah his shameless audacity his boldness his over-the-top confidence that his friend is going his certainty that his friend is going to help him he'll get up and give him everything he needed then so that's the attitude that jesus is trying to show us that's what jesus is trying to show us in this parable that our attitude with respect to prayer god's attitude towards prayer is what yes ask and it shall be given you for everyone that asketh through who give it to all liberally and upbraideth not that's god's attitude towards prayer now jesus is showing us what our attitude towards prayer needs to be and in this parable what has he shown us that we need to have a an attitude of chutzpah, of confidence, of shameless audacity in going before God. Now, some Christians, they get mad at us when we start talking about that, and, and they uh, think, oh, well, you're telling people to be rude. No, 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 no. That's not the way it works. 
I'm not telling you to pretend to have shameless audacity when you go to God. I'm not telling you to act like you have chutzpah when you go to God in prayer. I'm not telling you to come boldly. I mean, the Bible's telling you that. Jesus is telling you that. But here's what I want you to see. I'm not telling you to pretend that you have boldness. I'm not telling you to pretend to act like you have chutzpah. I'm not telling you to act like you have shameless audacity. I'm telling you that when you're operating rightly in prayer, when you're operating in faith when it comes to prayer, what you will have is shameless audacity. It's not imitation chutzpah that Jesus is talking about. It's real chutzpah he's talking about. How does that chutzpah come? It comes from knowing God. It comes from knowing God, having a connection, a living connection to God. Hallelujah. Does that make sense to you? So that in the story of Honey, which I told you last week, Honey, who caused it to rain by drawing a circle in the ground and insisting that God answers his prayer, the people of Honey's days, the rabbis that talked about Honey, they talked about him in a disparaging way as though he was a spoiled child asking his father for things and his father had to give it to him because he was a spoiled child. Hallelujah. What was Tony's attitude? It was boldness. It was shameless audacity. It was chutzpah. He comes to his father and asks him for things, expecting to receive them. Can you see that? Hallelujah. But that has to be a real attitude that flows from your heart. That has to be your relationship with God. It's not, I'm not saying pretend you have that. I'm not saying act like you have that. I'm saying that's the attitude that you need to have. In other words, let me put it to you this way. What Jesus is saying here when he says shameless audacity, what he's saying here when he uses that word that the scholars tell us could be translated chutzpah, hallelujah, he's talking about faith. In fact, Robert Lindsay, who's an expert in the Gospels, an expert in Hebrew, he says this. He says chutzpah is a good equivalent for what Jesus meant by faith. Chutzpah, the Yiddish word chutzpah is a good equivalent for what Jesus meant by faith. Hallelujah. Can you see that? So here he's saying because of the man's chutzpah, he'll come up and give him whatever he needed. Not because he's, he's not because he is his friend, but because of his chutzpah, he'll get up and give him everything that he needed. Hallelujah. So according to Bob Lindsay, who's an expert at these things, he says chutzpah, that's a good translation for what Jesus meant by faith. Hallelujah. So, so we could say this, because of his faith, he will rise up and give him everything he needs. Let me, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here. Hallelujah. 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 I remember years ago, uh, there was a, a lady who attended our church, and she was from Africa, and a uh, very educated family. She had a, a degree in architecture. She had a sister who was a, a pharmacist. She had a brother who was a doctor. Her dad was a professor of economics at some university in Africa. Hallelujah. And one time he came to visit them here. So they invited me over to the house so I could meet their dad. And so I'm talking to their dad, you know, just he and I talking alone. And he says to me, I don't, I don't listen, what do I want to show you? I want to show you the kind of audacity, the kind of chutzpah, the kind of faith that Jesus is talking about that we need to have as our attitude with respect to prayer. That's what he's showing us. Our attitude towards prayer needs to be one of chutzpah one of extreme confidence, one of shameless audacity, one of certainty, one of we know what's going to happen. Hallelujah. So this man, this professor of economics, he told me this. He said, I don't understand these Christians. He was an atheist. He had studied, you know, at some communist university or something like that. So he was an atheist. He said to me, I don't understand these Christians who go around saying they're saved. They won't know they're saved until they get to heaven and God determines whether or not they're saved. Can you see that? And so I showed him from Romans chapter 10 
And I showed him that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But here's what I want you to see. Can you see how from his point of view, all of us Christians who go around saying, well, I'm saved. I'm a Christian. Can you see from his point of view what we had was shameless audacity. We're claiming to be saved before we even arrive before the throne of God. We're claiming that we're saved before we even know we're saved is the way he was thinking about. Can you see that? But we'll go, oh yeah, I'm saved. I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven when I die. Can you see from his point of view how sh what shameless audacity, what chutzpah, that's what he was objecting to. He was objecting to the chutzpah of Christians who say they're saved. Hallelujah, hallelujah. But can you see how in the same way that you as a Christian know that you're saved, in the same way that you as a Christian know you're saved, in that exact same, that very same way, you're supposed to know that God answers your prayers. That's supposed to be your, in the same way that you have the chutzpah to say you're going to heaven when you die, you should have the chutzpah to say God always answers my prayers. 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 <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 That's the attitude Jesus is trying to show us here in this parable. This attitude of shameless audacity towards prayer. This attitude of chutzpah towards asking God for things. This attitude of boldness. This attitude of over-the-top confidence and certainty in asking God for things so that we can boldly proclaim when I ask it is given to me and in fact that's what Jesus says in the very next verse after he says this he said I say unto you ask and it shall be given you for everyone that asketh receiveth ask and it shall be given you seek and you shall find knock and it shall be open unto you for everyone that asketh receiveth he that seeketh find to him that knocketh it shall be open can you see what he's trying that's the attitude we got to get into the faith attitude we got to get it that that's the same thing James said let him ask in faith nothing wavering let him ask in faith nothing wavering oh my god I'm almost out of time Let's turn over to Luke chapter 18. I want to show you this second of these parables of prayer that Jesus taught. The second of the prayer parables that Jesus taught. And I like to call this one the parable of the crazy old widow lady. The parable of the crazy old widow lady. And let's start at verse 1, Luke chapter 18, verse 1. And Jesus says this, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge which neither feared which, I'm sorry, saying there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she wear me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Hallelujah. 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 Okay. So now, in order to straighten, the traditional interpretation of that verse is the same as the traditional interpretation of, of the parable that we just read in Luke chapter 11. The traditional interpretation of the parable of the friend with chutzpah is that the friend was persistent, that he kept asking, and he kept asking, and he kept asking, and the guy told him no, and he kept asking, and he kept asking, and the guy said no, and he kept asking, and eventually the guy relented. And well, I guess what we're supposed to learn from that is that if we'll keep on asking, God may eventually answer us, or God will eventually answer us. And that's the same uh, traditional interpretation of this verse, that the widow kept coming, the widow kept coming. There's not really anything in this passage that shows that she kept coming, so there's some kind of 
uh, uh, liberties with the interpretation that they're taking. And to show you what he's really, the point Jesus is really making, I want to start at verse 5 and then go back to the beginning. I need to show you wh how he concludes the, the story part of this parable and, and show you where the translation is mistaken and the interpretation is wrong. Then we'll go back and read it again and you'll understand what it is that Jesus is saying. So look here at, at Luke chapter 18, verse 5, and it says this, Yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she wear me. Yet because this widow troubleth me, I will... Well, let me stop with avenge her, since we're on that right now. Avenge her in this context. In Hebrew, the word for avenge would probably be mishpat. And mishpat would ordinarily be translated into English as judge. So I will judge her. But when we say I will judge her in English, that doesn't make sense because we usually think of judging as a negative thing. And so I'll, I'll judge her. We tend to think, no, but judging, even in English, judging can be a good thing. Sometimes, you know, I'm a lawyer. I go to court. I get a judgment. When I go to court, I want to get a judgment. That's what I want. I want the judge to judge in my favor. That's the idea of this. He said, I will judge for not. In other words, what it really means is I'll take her side. I'll decide on her behalf. Uh, it's not necessarily somebody's trying to hurt her. It could be uh, the example that Lindsay gives is that she couldn't pay her rent, maybe. You know, she's a widow. She has no source of income. She can't pay her rent. She goes to the judge, and in that society, this would be perfectly acceptable. She goes to the judge. In that culture, this way, in the culture of Jesus, in the culture of the Bible, that would be perfectly acceptable. She goes to the judge and says, judge me of my adversary. Who's the adversary? The guy who wants the rent. Well, what is she saying? In our society, it wouldn't make sense. Well, you got to force her to pay the rent or get out. But in that culture, the judge could decide no. It's better for society in general that that man let the widow stay there in the house rent free or at a reduced rent of some kind, something that the widow can afford because otherwise what's going to happen to the widow? We're going to have widows wandering the street. So the judge could just decide, no, no, she can stay in your house rent free. And that's what she's asking for something like that. When she says avenge me, it's not like some kind of revenge thing like we tend to think. No, it's judge me like that. Take my side against this guy. Take my side. To judge in my favor. Judge that I don't have to pay rent because I'm a widow woman. It's something like that. Okay, let's go on. So he says this. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, though I fear not God nor regard man. Verse 5, this is one I want to show you. Yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Hallelujah. Now, first of all, the word continual coming, the word continual coming in that verse in that verse is the Greek, what's translated continual coming there is a Greek word telos. And telos always, I mean, I don't know that much about the Greek language, but I knew this as soon as I saw it. Telos is talking about the end, the goal, the point of the end, the end something. In fact, there's an English theological word we use teleology, which talks about the end things. It's the doctrine of end things, the doctrine of the culmination of all things. That's what that word means. It doesn't, as far as I know, it never or hardly ever, but it definitely usually means the end. Hardly ever, if ever, does it mean coming continually. So it's not talking about her coming continually. It's talking about something to do with the end. At the end, when she's finished, when she's done. And you can understand what it means because the next part, it says, in the King James, it says, she weary me by her continual coming. She weary me. The word or the phrase translated, she weary me, is a word that literally means she gives me a black eye. She gives me a black eye. Or one translator translates it, she strangles me. Or I, I like one real old English translation. Translation It says, if at the end she'll come and hag me. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but hag me. <laughs> Hallelujah. But she'll 
give me a black eye. She'll beat me up. She'll strangle me is what it's talking about. It's not talking about through her continual coming. She'll worry me. It's saying at the end, she'll come. I better give her what she wants because or else at the end, she's going to come and beat me up. It's important that you understand that so you can understand what the whole parable is saying. Let me read it to you from the NIV, verse 5. Let me get over there to Luke chapter 18. You're my handy dandy phone Bible. Luke chapter 18, verse 5. And this is the New International Version, a modern translation. And it says this, Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. In other words, he's going to do what she wants. So in the NIV, it says, so that she won't eventually come and attack me. I I'm going to do what she wants so she won't eventually come and attack me. I'll do what she wants so she won't eventually come and attack me. Hallelujah. Can you see? That's the conclusion of the thing. That's the conclusion of the story. The guy does what she wants because he's afraid she's going to come and give him a black eye. She's afraid this crazy old lady is going to come and give him trouble. Hallelujah. That's why I like to call this parable the parable of the crazy old widow lady. <laughs> the parable of the crazy old widow lady. She's got this guy all scared that that this widow lady is going to come and beat him up. So now let's go back to the beginning and read the whole parable with that in mind. That at the end, he does what she wants because he's afraid that she's going to come back and give him a black eye. He's afraid she's going to come and strangle him. So let's go back to verse 2. He said, in a, certain in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. This is the NIV I'm reading to you right now. In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. Hallelujah. Now, there's the twist. There's the joke in the parable. There's the funny part of the parable. A lot of these parables have sort of a twisting, funny part to them. And that's the twisting, funny part of this parable. What? That here's a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. He's not scared. In the King James, it says, who neither feared God nor man. Hallelujah. But apparently he fears crazy old widow lady. So you can see at the end, this guy, he's, so, he's not scared of anybody. He's not scared of anybody. And so you can see the joke at the end being, you know, that yes, he is scared of this widow lady. Anyway, now go on to verse 3. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming. The NIV says kept coming, but it could just be uh, happen one time. It could be multiple. It could be one time. There's not really any way to judge from this. If you believe the context is that she came multiple times and you're going to translate it, she kept coming. If you don't believe that, then you're going to translate it that she just came. Hallelujah. So uh, in the King James, it says, and there was, and it's irrelevant to what I want to show you. And there was a widow woman coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. Now, here's the part I want you to see. Why was the, what did this widow woman do? She came, and according to the NIV, she came with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. What did this widow do that caused the guy to think at the end, uh, she's going to come and I'm going to do what she wants because she may come and beat me up. What was it that the widow lady did? Well, I, I'm convinced that this is being mistranslated. Again, she's not just coming and asking. She's not coming and pleading. The Hebrew equivalent of this word that's being, the NIV is translated with the plea. The Hebrew equivalent of that in the King James, it says, uh, came to him saying, the Hebrew equivalent is, again, it's Amar, and it can mean demand, and that's what's happening here. I'm convinced that's what's going on here, that the widow isn't just showing, this isn't some, you know, we have the wrong picture of the widow. We have this picture of this meek little man, please, sir. Please, would you help me? When that's the wrong, there's another picture of widow ladies, of widow older women who've had enough. They've had it up to here. They're not putting up with anything anymore. And they go in there and she didn't say, please judge, help me. She said, judge, 
Do your job and avenge me of my adversary. Give me judgment, judge. And she was so bold and so demanding in it that at the end, the guy was afraid and gave her what she wanted. Hallelujah. 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 Can you see that? But now let's skip on. Let's go on because I'm almost out of time. Look at the next verse. For some time he refused. And that's the key to the parable. That's what Jesus wants us to see. For some time he refused. In other words, the woman came in. She came in with chutzpah. She demanded her rights. She demanded that the guy do what she needed. She demanded that the guy give her justice. She demanded that the guy do judgment for her. But as far as she could tell, nothing happened. That's the key to this parable. For a while, he would not, in the King James, for a while, he would not. That's the key to this. That's what Jesus wants us to see. That as far as the widow was concerned, the answer was no. She couldn't tell any different. As far as she was concerned, nothing had happened. And yet, in the end, even this guy who neither fears God nor man, Gave her what she wanted. Hallelujah. How much more? How much more quickly? How much more certain is it that God is going to answer our prayers? Unfortunately, I'm out of time, but I'm not finished. Come back next week. Listen, if you get anything out of this, if you want to learn more, if you want to grow, you want to read some of our material, go to our website, www.ibchristiancenter.com. There's a place there also if... Uh, where you can learn about our church services, 8 a.m. Sunday mornings. Uh, also, if you can, donate, contribute, help us, support us, help us to keep this worldwide ministry going by pushing on the Feed the Ox button there on our website and contrib contributing through PayPal. We'll re really appreciate it, and I'll see you later. Bye-bye.